Uh, welcome to Nea Dor's discussion on women polit in political leadership yes, as we honor you. International Women's Day. Uh, International Women's Day is marked annually on March 8th to celebrate women's achievements, raise awareness about women's equality, and to lobby for accelerated gender parity. And one of the most important ways to achieve gender parity and women's equality is through political engagement and representation. Can't hear you. You can't hear me? You guys good? Okay, we have an exciting panel of dynamic Pakistani American women with years of experience and background in organizing, running for political office, serving in government as elected officials and political appointees, mm. heading national political campaign efforts, and more. I wanted to start off. Can you? Can Can you guys hear me? Yes. Talat, I think you might be, oh, maybe Talat is having some um, um, some technical difficulties. Maybe she'll log back on. Okay. I wanted to start off by introducing myself. My name is Sumbul Aurangzeb. I'm based out of Dallas, Texas, and I work for the United States House of, House of Representatives. I'm also the president of the Muslim Democratic Caucus of Texas and have worked on various political campaigns. I would now like to introduce our panelists. Our first panelist is the Honorable Mayor Sumbul Siddiqui, who is currently serving her second term on the Cambridge City Council and first as mayor of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Mayor Sumbul Siddiqui immigrated to the United States from Karachi, Pakistan at the age of two along with her family. And she's the first Muslim mayor in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, mayor Siddiqui has been politically engaged or civically engaged from a very young age. Uh, she's been, uh, 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 received, she's received numerous awards for her uh, civic engagement and her work. She did her bachelor's degree in public policy from Brown University. Uh, she also served as an AmeriCorps volunteer at New Profit. Um, and then she completed her JD from Northwestern School of Law. Um, and then she moved back east and she practiced uh, as a legal aid attorney with Northeast Legal Aid, serving uh, communities of Lawrence, Lynn, and Lowell, Massachusetts. Uh, throughout her time as a public si a servant, Mayor Siddiqui has advocated on behalf of the city's most vulnerable, strive to create more affordable housing, and protect households under threat of displacement from facing eviction and homelessness. Mayor Siddiqui's focus has primarily been on promoting equitable access to education for Cambridge families by increasing scholarship funding, for low-income low income children to attend high quality preschools and advancing the implementation of a children's savings account program uh, alongside the vice mayor. Uh, as mayor, Mayor Siddiqui continues to promote affordable housing, um, addressing the region's broader affordable uh, affordability crisis. And uh, since COVID-19 uh, has occurred, Mayor Siddiqui has, um, has been on the ground running with various programs, which we can hopefully get uh, get into her, get into uh, with her in just a little bit. Um, our next panelist is Dr. Sena Sayed, who is the Executive Vice President of Community Outreach and Development for Nicholas Residential, and she's currently running for Dallas City Council, uh, District 2. Sena is also the founder of Kimya International, a 501c3, a nonprofit organization dedicated to raising awareness about humanitarian efforts through documentaries, photography, and short stories. Previous to uh, her current work, Sana served as the director of the Public Information Office, and she was the spokesperson for the city of Dallas. She managed the city's international responses to the first U.S. case of Ebola and the July 7th ambush on Dallas Police Department officers and worked closely with community and civic leaders. Sana began her career as a broadcast journalist and over a period of 10 years worked as an assignment editor, producer, reporter, and news anchor. Sana holds a bachelor's of science degree in economics, a master's of science in journalism from TCU, and a PhD in public policy from UTA. Um, our next panel panelist is Dr. Amina Zia, who served as a political appointee in the executive cabinet of St. Louis County government and spearheaded a countywide inclusive policy to accommodate head coverings, as in hijabs, by using a stakeholder approach. The policy is now rep replicated across the justice service departments uh, across the country. She is a professor of political economy and gender politics and founder of a social impact consulting firm. Our next panelist is Aisha Yuki, who's an attorney and social entrepreneur 
uh, and activist here in North Texas. She's a founding member of the American Muslim Professionals of Dallas and is active, an active member of the Dallas-Fort Worth Muslim Bar Association. Aisha received her bachelor's in political science and international studies from Southern Methodist University, where she also received her Juris Doctorate. She is on the national board of APPAC, and she was one of the driving forces, uh, one of the leaders of Pakistanis for Biden. And our um, final panelist is Thalit Hamdani. Is Thalit back on? Oops. Okay, let's, we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully get her back. Thalit Hamdani um, is, ran for Brookhaven Town Council. Um, and uh, actually her experience is, um, begins before that. Uh, Thalit uh, basically came on the scene after her son, uh, who was a 9-11 uh, first responder, uh, passed away in the attack, and um, when her son did 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 respond to the attacks, um, and he went missing, he was actually originally suspected of being um, affiliated with the attackers. Uh, so that launched Dalit into her um, her career or her passion of um, uh, speaking up against Islamophobia and advocating for the Muslim American community. And we're going to try and get her back on. Let me see what's what's going on with her. I but see you. Can't you see me? Yes, yes. Okay, wonderful. Hi, I'm Philip. There. Hi, Hi, wonderful, wonderful. So welcome, ladies. Thank you so much for taking the time to be a part of our program. Uh, I wanted to start off the discussion by wishing you all a happy International Women's Day and ask, what does this day mean to you? Uh, why is it important that we have a day that is dedicated to women? Why is it important for both men and women to recognize and celebrate the contribution of women to society on this day? And let's start with Mir Siddiqui. Well, thank you so much for having me today. It's great to be here with uh, all the panelists on this, uh, this uh, International Women's Day. So. You know, I think for me, the when I reflect on the work that I do day to day, uh, and uh, I think about who I work with, uh, and how things get done, um, it's really uh, the women I work with, uh, and I, I see that every day. So this this day, really, it's a moment to reflect uh, on how far we've come, and also an opportunity to think about uh, the future uh, and the possibilities we have ahead as we work together uh, on, you know, tackling gender equality uh, in all the ways, inequality in all the ways that it shows up. So really think uh, also you can't, you know, do much of this work without allies and teamwork. Uh, and uh, so that that's, I see it every day in the work that I do as an elected uh, official, uh, but it, it, we have to celebrate women every day, I think. Uh, and, you know, how, uh, you know, how many achievements that, um, you know, women contribute to our society. Uh, but it is great to have a day that we can actually focus on it and reflect. Uh, Dr. Sayed, same question. What does this day mean to you? And uh, why is it important for men and women to celebrate? Thanks for the opportunity. Excited to be here. Well, you know, International Women's Day to me is a real nod to the fact that when women succeed in a society, that it, entire society is elevated and is it's lifted up. And so in the communities around the world where we see women in an oppressive state, I think, you know, we see how that, that society suffers. And so for us, you know, having women uh, celebrate each other, elevate each other, uh, not knock each other down. It's such an important day, but also recognizing the work ahead of us for the young girls in our community and and lifting them up so they're able to serve in leadership capacities as well. So this is an amazing day and I'm excited to share this space with each of you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Dr. Zia, same question. Thank you, Sambal. I'm very appreciative of this dialogue today because, you know, uh, we get to share ideas and solutions on how to advance gender equality and to improve societies. We know that the glass ceiling for women in political leadership access um, is exists. And, you know, we also know that data confirms that there are many gaps in women's representation across the board. So as we celebrate International Women's Day, Sambal, as you asked, I'm thankful for this conversation and hopeful that from our discussion today, we can add value to the 
understanding of the recent, the modest progress that has been made in women's political leadership as we look more closely um, at the significant gaps that still exist in women's representation across uh, positions of power and influence. And we know that when um, more women work, that economies prosper and productivity increases and businesses benefit from organizational effectiveness and growth. And we also know that if you know more women are in leadership positions, that change in progress happens at a faster rate. Um, you know, corruption levels decrease and democratic processes strengthen. So studies show us that there are absolute benefits to having more inclusive political systems and the conversation should be directed towards how we can encourage women's political participation. And I'm looking forward to hearing our dynamic panelists share their thoughts and also share their journeys as they trailblaze through this very male dominated space. So thank you, Zimbal. No, right, absolutely, absolutely. Now, Aisha, what about you? Why, why do you think it's so important for us to recognize uh, women's uh, efforts? Yeah, thank you so much for uh, having me here. Um, I definitely want to just echo what everyone has said. Um, and then most importantly, just uh, emphasize the systems uh, that we're living in. And um, I know we've heard recently a lot about uh, structural racism, um, but, you know, a lot of this applies as well to sexism. And I think that, you know, uh, we need to look at how our political systems, our judicial systems um, are really, really dominated by men. And, you um, as, as a result of that, women all over the world are segregated and exploited. And so by celebrating International Women's Day, we're giving them a reason to have, to have these dialogues to, um, you know, uh, I guess eventually like to bring women up to the same level playing field. Awesome, thank you. And Thalith, why do you think that it's important that we celebrate International Women's Day? Well, thank you for hosting this uh, important landmark uh, event, uh, it is important for uh, International Day to celebrate this International Day because it recognizes that women are the rocks of the family and the nation. They bring change and it is important for our future generations to see uh, the women playing the leading role, not in, in the family, but in their communities and in their nation. So we are the role model and we need to move forward asserting our identity as a woman. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you all. Thank you so much for, for your responses. Um, I, do, I do want to just take a quick second to recognize our sisters in Pakistan who took part in the Aurat March, which is an amazing effort. So we, um, we were with you and we stand with you in hopes that inshallah, um, uh, women and girls in Pakistan uh, continue to increase their quality of life. So we do wanna recognize that that was going on. Um, I guess with time difference, it was maybe kind of this morning early or late last night, but it's, it's going on. Um, let me ask, uh, so we have seen an increase of Pakistani American women engaged in the political space since the last election. And, and prior to that, I think that it's uh, continuously going up that our women from our community are um, more politically engaged. What does that mean for our diaspora at large? And um, what are some of the barriers to women's participation? And this can be, whoever wants to respond to this can, can go ahead. Let me respond. Okay. All right, so the most, I mean, in our diaspora, in the Pakistani Muslim diaspora, Indian Pakistani, but basically South Asian, uh, the most important barrier that I felt, you know, was fundraising. Okay. Fundraising was a challenge for me. Uh, people do not understand the importance of donating to the funds for uh, candidates who are running for the office. And the other obstacle that I faced, uh, I'm sad to say, somebody voiced it also. It is the, uh, the male misogynistic behavior of the men in our communities who do not uh, want the women to take the leadership role, unfortunately. So that is something that we need to address. Everybody is in this together, fighting for recognition of our community, of our needs, and as such, we need to work together. So that is the, those are the two obstacles that I faced when I ran for office. What was the other question, Sambul? 
Oh, that was that was basically basically okay. it. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And does, has anyone else faced that experience? Have you guys had um, issues with you know misogyny from community members or or just oh, yeah. from the greater community? Absolutely, uh -huh. I can speak to that. Um, so you know, d no organization that I'm currently a member of, you know, thankfully I've, I haven't experienced it. Uh, if anything, um, I've had a very welcoming experience in some of the recent organizations that have joined where they really do want to hear the voices of women and empower them. Um, but in the broader community, I will say, you know, there has been um, a backlash. And I think a lot of it really is this cultural element of, you know, not having women in the public sphere, right? Um, and things that go generations back, um, the visibility of women, whether that's your physical appearance or your voice. Um, I have had comments, um, you know, I've had people get upset about, you know, in Urdu they say leja, like your tone. And it's like, oh, well, you know, her leja is wrong. And it's like, okay, well, if you're trying to make a point and you're passionate about something, um, it, it's really interesting because, you know, you would never hear that, uh, that type of comments uh, addressed to a man, right? is that, oh, that his tone is off. So I think especially in our society, um, you know, the, this whole um, obsession, I think, with the way that women appear, the way that they speak, everything has to be according to a specific protocol that a man decides. And, you know, time's up for that. that that's just not acceptable anymore. Absolutely. I hear you. Um, Sana, Sumbul, uh, Amina, do you guys have anything, uh, any experience with, with the same issue? So um, I, I would like to add that, you know, um, I have been a part of a couple of different diaspora organizations through the, uh, through the last few years. And, you know, um, on the boards of these organizations, we still have not achieved gender parity. Um, right. So we have more male um, leaders on these boards. And I think that um, that helps set the tone, that helps set the culture. Um, although these organizations also, as Aisha mentioned, have also been very welcoming of, of younger females, younger women coming into, um, you know, kind of an advisory capacity, maybe not so much in the leadership roles. Um, I think that when we talk about uh, misogyny, I think we also need to talk about age. I think that, you know, with aunties and uncles, predominantly leading the um, leadership roles in our community diaspora organizations, a lot of times they look to the younger women leaders as, you know, um, as kids, right? So I think that that's another variable that compounds that sort of a barrier for, for our generation. I, I will like to say that um, when we talk about barriers for women's participation, you know, especially in, you know, uh, Sumbal and Sana would love to hear, and Tala, they would love to hear your comments on this as well, is, you know, um, running, when you're running for election, you obviously need a party nomination. Um, party nominations also come with financial support, not just from the diaspora community, but from the mainstream community. So um, we know that, you know, both political parties have very different ways of approaching women um, women politicians, particularly in the party systems. And, and I think that does play out and, and being from a South Asian descent, um, you know, that also compounds to that barrier. I think that that's a very real barrier as Talat pointed out, fi um, finances, campaign financing, also party nominations, and then also recognition without within our own diaspora uh, organizations, political organizations, um, do they support you or do they not support you financially and, you know, et cetera? Right, absolutely. Um, Mayor Siddiqui, do, do, do uncles ever call you, like, do they ever treat you like a kid? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I think it's, as I reflect, there has been ageism, there's been um, this notion of, you know, you don't have the life experience to kind of to, you know, tell me about how things work. Uh, but generally, I think in Cambridge, you know, where it's nonpartisan, and so that makes it much easier. Um, but I think what's been said about fundraising, um, that that's, there's many barriers for fundraising for, um, you know, women, but especially women of color. Uh, and then uh, just, you know, making sure you're getting your name out there. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't face too much Islamophobia. I faced a lot of um, you know, a lot of questions around where I was from uh, and, and where my name was from. And even in a place, Cambridge is a very, you know, you're often in competition of like, who's the most liberal, um, but it's, it's still, it does come up. 
Um, and, you know, what I've seen, it's a lot of conversations and, and, you know, sharing with people, you know, where, where you've grown up and um, even with the uncles and aunties, I think eventually I found so much support in the community because, because what they said was, it's really important for us to see that people who look like me, you know, be in that position so that they can make a call. Uh, they can call in Hindi or Urdu and say, you know, I need help with this. I need help with that. So um, I think there was initially some explaining that, you know, why I'm doing this. And then, you know, a lot of people just came around and there's just so much support. So it, it's it's been great. That's awesome. And Sana, you're, you're running now for Dallas City Council. Have you have you received support from both, you know, the Pakistani American community as well as just the greater um, the greater community in Dallas? Absolutely. I mean, you know, when we look at why there are so many Pakistani American women running for office, I think this speaks to the fact that we pursued our education, we pursued our careers, we prioritized ourselves, which is something that a lot of our moms and our grandmothers were unable to do. And so us being in this position where we are able to run for office speaks to the freedom that has been generated because of these opportunities that have been provided to us by the sacrifices of our families. And so this, this really speaks to the freedom of women um, in American society, and it's a beautiful thing to see. When we talk about obstacles, fundraising is a big obstacle because we don't have generational support in this country. Most of us have families and we're first generation. And so that means that a lot of that infrastructure that is needed to fundraise at a, mon at a monstrous level is just not there. Um, now, with that said, because we have roots here in this country, you know, for those of us who are raised here and born and raised here, we can lean on our on our colleagues from our workspace and our friends from you know growing up. And so we do have some network here that allows us to to show that we are present. And so far, you know, all the the feedback I've gotten is people are really excited to see representation. You know, in Dallas being one of the largest cities in the United States. We still do not have Muslim representation. We still do not have South Asian representation. So this this is definitely a, a big step toward breaking that glass ceiling. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. And I just, I've seen a couple of comments. We're mostly talking about from the perspective of Pakistani American women and political leadership. What can can we do anything um, in relation or in any way to help um, uh, the lives of women in Pakistan, women and girls in Pakistan? Is there a way that we can give back to um, our our you know our, our sisters that um, that are that are in Pakistan um, from here in the United States? How how can we help them through political leadership? And anyone could respond. I'll try to tackle that one. Um, so we have a comment that says that 17% of women in Pakistan have quotas, reserve seats in Pakistan. And I think that that is so crucial because when we talk about representation, like Sana mentioned and Sobol and, uh, and, and, and others mentioned, I think it's important to have a, um, you know, a, a system in place that allows for women to enter this very male dominated space. And I think that quotas have been recognized around the world as being that avenue that means to establish somewhat of a semblance, um, uh, somewhat, somewhat of, you know, an opportunity for women. And I think in Pakistan, we do see that. And, you know, as we're having this discussion here in the United States and in the backdrop, we have an Earth March going on, which is quite dynamic, you know, quite revolutionary, quite historic. And I think that just by us, you know, being present in this space with Sana running in, in, in a major city like Dallas, um, you know, in Sumbul, you know, you're in Cambridge, you've already, you know, uh, won the election and, and fell the same here. I think that we are showing women in Pakistan also that, you know, there is some sort of sisterhood. There's a camaraderie. You know, we are talking about representing ourselves because we all come from that same post-colonial cultural um, implications and barriers, whatever we want to call those. Um, and so we're all fighting the same fight, um, whether we're here or in Pakistan. That's right. That's true. That's absolutely that's absolutely correct. Does anyone else have any comments on that? Um, I feel like Aisha's about to say something. Uh, let me know if I'm cutting you off. Sorry, Aisha. <laughs> um, so 
All, the other thing I think you know is important to recognize is that we, as Pakistani women, um, you know, coming from you know, as we're talking about right now, right now, post-colonial effects, right? We have trauma that has been that is not reconciled in a lot of ways, and so we often see women working through that trauma and getting to a place where they can stand on their own two feet and addressing mental health. And I think that also needs to be an important part of the conversation. Is we didn't just show up, right? We didn't just get here. It was a lot of hard work, um, pushing through some some serious stigma growing up. So even though right now we have generated quite a bit of respect and we're not hitting those same barriers, those barriers were there growing up. And and so you know, for young girls, how do you and young women, how do you overcome that? You know, how do you address trauma so that you can go on to serve and serve at at your greatest and your most optimal capacity? And to do that, we really do have to address. Uh, you know, what, what sets us back as a community. And Aisha, did you, did you want to add on to that? Sure. Um, you know, and I, I'm just going to kind of take this back to just visibility. Um, I think for, you know, our sisters in Pakistan that are, that are marching, you know, I mean, that's really the message that I'm hearing. I mean, I woke up to WhatsApp messages by people getting offended about this Orith March for all the wrong reasons. And I think that as a culture and as a community, we really need to stop getting offended over women wanting to march in the streets. I mean, this is this is literally the, the basic foundation of a democracy of, you know, how to exercise your rights as a citizen. Um, sure, you can disagree with some of the messages, but, you know, th this offend, be, you know, being offended because you're seeing women on the streets. I mean, there's just so much misunderstanding. Um, you know, there's uh, there's there's barriers as it relates to language. I mean, you know, there's there certain slogans in English. They think it's a Western, you know, concept. But you know, this isn't a Western concept. This is a Muslim concept. This is an Islamic concept. I mean, Pakistan has had, you know, one of the first female prime ministers in the country who had a tragic death. I mean, you know, like to, to Dr. Sana's point about trauma, man, like, you know, if I have family members telling me like, oh, you should run for office, you know, my gut instinct is like, uh, you know, based on our history, I, I don't know if that's such a good idea. So, so, you know, let's, let's address the trauma. Let's, let's address the communication gap. Um, but let, let's, you know, let the, let the women be visible, you know, let them speak, let's hear what they have to say and really have an intention to have an understanding of, you know, to understand what it is that they're wanting to um, address. Yeah, absolutely. I know that people, some people were offended about the slogan, Meri Jisum Meri Merzi, which just means, you know, my body, my choice, right? And for some reason, some people decided that that meant something dirty, which I think is kind of a reflection on those individuals, um, you know, and uh, in countries and in a country like Pakistan, where women are often, you know, pressured to have children maybe earlier than they want to, keep having children, even though it's detrimental to their own health and so many other issues. A slogan like Mary Just and Mary Mercy is, is very, very important and very, very relevant. It's a life and death situation. So I, I completely agree with you. Um, I was going to ask, um, since we were kind of talking about trauma and how that relates, um, Talat, um, you have dealt with, with a lot of crisis and trauma. Um, uh, you know, regarding uh, your son, uh, Salman. And um, uh, if you'd like to, you know, maybe tell tell the audience a little bit about what happened. And then I wanted to ask, um, do you think that your experiences uh, relating to that crisis and relating to that trauma, do you think that makes you better suited to be in the role of political leadership? Oh, Dalit, you're muted, hold on. And uh, uh, Salman was uh, um, an NYPD cadet, and he responded to the call of duty uh, and rushed to the Twin Towers as he was going into work that day. He worked in Manhattan at Rockefeller University, and that was his first year in the medical program. And um, so he rushed down to the towers and he had forgotten his cell phone on the job the day before, so there was no way to con connect with him. And when he didn't come home that night, you know, we were not worried so much because we knew he would go down there. But then as hours converted into days and days into weeks, 
and uh, uh, weeks into months. It, um, it was traumatic. Uh, my husband and I, we went down uh, searching for him for like a few days uh, uh, downtown near the Twin Towers. And of course, nobody could have recognized him amongst those uh, ashes and the debris that fell that day. And so what happened was I contacted the NYPD and they had given us few numbers to contact uh, at the armory when we were looking for him, searching for him. And I don't know why, but they started investigating him as linked, someone linked, associated with those attacks. And that, of course, was because of his first name, Muhammad. And that put me on the path of speaking up, defending my faith. Not only my family and my community, but most importantly, my faith. Because the, the attackers were supposedly Muslim and they were not, none of them were American. They were all from Saudi Arabia. Uh, so they say, you know. And uh, anyway, so coming back to those days, uh, we searched everywhere and so I started speaking up and the first few, and then we went to Mecca on October 11th, exactly a month after we went to Mecca to pray uh, for his safe return. And the evening that we are leaving, uh, New York Times, New York Post and Daily News, all these three uh, journalists came to my house and uh, I asked them, and the Tribune guy from Chicago, and I asked them, what brings you back here exactly a month later? And they told us that there's a flyer circulating the NYPD and the MTA, mass transit, with your son's uh, picture asking someone to, who, if, if someone has seen him to step forward. And later I got that flyer from one of someone from my uh, social circle. And it was not a, uh, it was a very bad flyer. It says, uh, wanted by terrorist task force, has medical ID, uh, has, you know, uh, all those things, chemistry major. And we were interrogated by our congressman at the time um, in Bayside, Gary Ackerman. And, uh, they came to the house to interrogate. It was a tough time. So that put me, you know, to defend. And I started speaking up. And to this day, I speak very ferociously defending uh, the community and my faith. And the tough position that I found myself at the time, I had become uh, a pariah in my own nation. And how can this be? My son, okay, he wasn't born here. That's what Gary Ackerman said. If he's not born here, he is an outsider and he could be whatever they want him to. He could be detained. So he made me write a letter to John Ashcroft asking him to release him. So they led me, my own government here, led me to believe that he is detained. That's cruel. And then... So we came back from Mecca, there were, and then there was an, a, a message on the answering machine that Ms. Hamdani come to the office. Uh, we have news about Salman from Ackerman's office, and that's when he interrogated us and everything. But now he's a very good friend. Uh, so uh, there was October, November, December, January. On March 20th, um, on March 20th, uh, the recovery was abolished. No more recovery from that site of the World Trade Center and it was uh, closed. <coughs> and uh, so we got uh, uh, two men from the tall black men in black coats rather uh, at 11 p.m. at my house knocking and they said, you know, uh, they gave us the card and contact the medical examiner. Uh, your son died that day in those attacks. So the next day, my husband and I, we went down to uh, NYU and uh, met the medical examiner and he had a 
package, uh, a file of all those. They found his body parts in 34 pieces and they gave us his jeans and one sock and a belt. My husband said those are his clothes. He was 23 years old. And uh, so I said, I want to have this uh, uh, testing done by my uh, an independent person, scientist, to determine whether these are the remains of Salman or not. And he pulled the file back to himself and he said, go get yourself a lawyer, Ms. Hamdani. So there are nuances that still don't make sense to me to this day. So, so on March 20th, uh, they gave everybody a body bag. Whoever was not recovered from that site, I presume, but we were given a body bag and we were told it is, his remains are at uh, this place, you know, some funeral parlor in Queens. And then, uh, so we arranged a, a funeral on April 5th uh, at the mosque at 93 Street in Uptown Manhattan where He used to go and pray on Fridays. And then we buried him. So Tala, I'm that, sorry. Experience, that experience made me realize we are immigrants. No matter how many years, we are the first generation immigrants. And we need to challenge these prejudices it's not easy it's it will never be easy for a mom to bury the child but that gave me the strength and it validates validated my voice because i'm not lying what happened to me i faced islamophobia in the raw and i went searching for him and i went to guantanamo bay because they were high value detainees. I thought maybe he was one of them. It was a very hard road, but but Alhamdulillah, yeah, like I'm here today fighting for uh, defending my faith and the main, I didn't get much, uh, what can I say, a fl a flashback or no, not flashback, rejection from my mainstream community. The media was wrong. You know, the media was wrong, especially New York Post, you know, and you know, the Post has a reputation murder group. So, and then two years later, you know, two and a half years later, my husband died. Th that shattered us, you know, so the three of us, I have two more boys, Alhamdulillah. So that is my story. So never forget you're an immigrant here. Never forget that you are a Muslim. I remember saying that he made transition from this life to the next easy for me. And I pray when the time comes, he come and take me. That's it. So that I'm, I'm, I want to thank you uh, for, for everything that you've done for the Pakistani American community, for the Muslim community. I was... Um, maybe around 15 when September 11th happened. And, you know, in a small town in Texas, you can imagine the, the racism and the Islamophobia that, you know, I had to deal with, my siblings had to deal with, we all had to deal with. And I remember reading about you, you know, I've, I've read about you for, for very, for over so many different years. And I always admired you so much for the strength that you have and, um, you know, Al-Santala make it easy for you and reward you and your family. And, um, uh, you know, the, the way I met Dalit was through the Pakistanis for Biden's efforts, which, you know, I, Aisha was yes. leading. So I'm very happy that we got to meet you and that we have such a strong leader as yourself. And uh, it is it is important for us to to um, be engaged uh, politically. It is important for the reasons that definitely, you said. Definitely, definitely. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, uh, uh, Sana, you were also dealt with um, a traumatic time and um, a, a crisis while you were with the city of Dallas um, when we had the, the first case of Ebola and uh, with the four Dallas police officers who were, um, who were attacked. 
Uh, do you think that that has, um, uh, going through that, that trauma or going through that, that moment of crisis, do you think that that's made you stronger um, and made you better suited for political leadership? Yeah, I mean, Bella, thank you for sharing your story. That was, uh, that's a lot to, to process. And um, I have a lot of respect for, for all that you've done and what you continue to stand for. Uh, so for, you know, the, the, the traumatic events that, that we went through in Dallas, I'll be honest, you know, growing up in a family where we endured quite a bit of trauma personally and as a family, and then connecting that with, with these other, you know, times when, when you see people suffering, um, you know, the summer of 2016 was my summer of death, right? I had five funerals to go through within three weeks. And, and I'll tell you, you know, when, when you endure trauma and then when you have to work through trauma, what it, what it really just goes back to is that you have to treat people as human beings. Everyone is a human being, right? The homeless person who's down the street from you is a human being. The, the person who cannot afford to pay for, for milk is a human being. We have to see one another as human beings. And when we are able to do that, then we are able to address through policy and, and actually address issues to, to, to not continue to, you know, surface level, put a bandaid on things, but actually dig in and start to address issues. So, um, because of my life experiences through my nonprofit, we created a program called Fight Club, which combines boxing, yoga, and therapy for women who are survivors of trauma here in the Dallas community. So addressing trauma is extremely important. And you know, when we had the protests last year in the city of Dallas, there was an immediate vote to defund the police. But some people in the community in this part of the city were simply not ready for that. And so, you know, when when we address you know, issues about, about the pain that people are feeling, I think we have to look at how do we build bridges? How do we bring people to the table to actually find solutions? And so um, there's actually a trauma-informed policing model that's being practiced in dif different parts of the United States right now that looks at the re-traumatization of individuals, particularly youth, but it also looks at addressing secondary trauma for police. And I think we have an opportunity to address that with police and fire. So when we talk about trauma, it really is being cognizant of what another human being is going through, having empathy and compassion and leadership and implementing that in policy that, so that we can actualize change. Fun. And Mayor, Mayor Siddiqui, you've, you've, you know, you, you got to be mayor during COVID. <laughs> so um, you, you know, obviously had to deal with um, this emergency situation, a crisis. And how has that made you stronger as a, as a, as a leader? You know, I think with the, with this crisis, it's um, been a lot about, um, you know, effective communication uh, and working together under a lot of stress and, acknowledging that we may not have the answers, right? But we have to figure out a process to get to the answers. And so it's definitely made me a stronger leader. It's definitely um, made me recognize that there have been so many weaknesses that our city has grappled with uh, that were there before COVID. But COVID has actually uh, provided this opportunity um, to do what we should have done, right? We knew kids didn't have internet at home. Um, we knew they didn't have computers, right? And we, but we, we had that, ha we knew it was happening. Um, and with COVID, you know, we had to act very fast. And so I think um, it's taught me how to, uh, uh, you know, move quickly, but to always listen. I think listening is key. There's, um, uh, you know, we, a lot of questions that our community members have. People are scared. Uh, so you have to be there for people um, in their weakest moments. Uh, and so this crisis has been very challenging. And as now we n navigate the vaccination rollout, um, it, you know, there's there's always um, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, so but but a lot of great, um, great examples of resilience in the community and coming together and working uh, with my colleagues uh, on the city council, on the school committee uh, and really just being collaborative. And that's what uh, COVID has shown me. Sorry, I have trouble unmuting myself. Thank you, thank you for that answer. I wanted to just switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about um, the past presidential elections and uh, the role that Pakistani American women uh, played in that. And um, uh, I, this, this question is open to the panel. I was gonna start with Aisha. 
What were some differences you noticed uh, in the engagement level, level of Pakistani American women uh, comparing when you compare um, the level of engagement with Hillary's campaign, um, uh, you know, yeah. previously? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so, you know, with the, with Hillary's campaign, I mean, I think that um, Pakistani American women um, just really, not only just Pakistani American women, I should say, all women. I mean, that that was a historic race for us, right? Is that you know, in the first time in U.S. history, we have a potential, uh, you know, female president, uh, com a commander in chief, you know, to come in and. Um, I think that we all had a sense of comfort and ease. Um, I think there may have been a, a tad bit of overconfidence in retrospect in, in kind of just the strategy for, for that particular campaign. Um, I know that I was involved in, you know, um, campaigning here in Texas. Uh, we hosted some events with a few organizations in town. Um, but, you know, just, just to kind of check off the list of, of what your typical campaign uh, contribution looks like. Um, but then when we saw what happened and, and the huge upset, you you know, when um, the uh, other candidate won, uh, you know, it was just really incredibly eye-opening for us. And I think it really pushed us into action. And I think one theme that I'm hearing, you know, from, from all the speakers here is that when you are impacted and when you feel pain in, in, in any form, in any shape or form, you know, that really prompts you into action. And the, the amount of Pakistani American women leadership that we witnessed in Pakistanis for Biden, um, you know, I just, I can't even explain, you know, exactly how that feels the because amount of it was not only Pakistani American women, but I saw South Asian women of all backgrounds, of all skill sets come in and really uh, take the charge on the grassroots organizing. Um, and I think our entire, uh, you know, National Council, the leadership, the directors, um, they all hands down said that, you know, Pakistani women really led uh, the, the show here and, and in all the battleground states that were involved. So I noticed a huge difference between uh, this recent Biden campaign um, so, yeah. And of, of course, you know, when I say Biden, I should say Biden Harris, because I think Kamala Harris is definitely a fueling force in that, at least for for me personally, and I'm sure for our, uh, fellow South Asian women. No, absolutely. And did anyone else, is anyone else engaged with the presidential campaign? I know we had Mayor Sumbul Siddiqui take part in um, an event for Muslim women for Biden. Um, Bella, did, I, know, I think you were also active with Pakistanis for Biden. Oh, you're, you're still muted. Okay, yes, so I made a phone call that uh, advocating for Biden, especially they wanted in those states where he was running low. Mm -hmm. So I made phone calls and then of course I motivated the community. And um, because of that, you know, um, my Democrat, you know, party told me that uh, the Muslim vote, the Desi vote, went up by 18% wow. in where I live now. So it is very important to mobilize because uh, our women, I'm mostly in, engaged with women at the mosque. There are two mosques over here. So I'm engaged with them and they know me from my original campaign. And uh, so they believe and they, some of them called me, who should we vote for? So that was something very amazing. So I am their political spokesperson and I do guide them and they do listen to me. So it is important to remain uh, mobilized. And uh, unfortunately, Hillary did not win, but now Kamala Harris won with Joe Biden. So it does make a difference and we need to be um, focused, you know, because uh, I'm a Democrat from day one. And as you see now in one month, he has done so much. This administration has done so much positive, you know, um, what can I say? He's taken actions, uh, not only of uh, economy, but COVID. So COVID is on the, you know, is sliding down now. And hopefully, you know, we will just keep moving forward and focus on other issues. Uh, they have forgiven the 10,000 student loans so if those of you who have some loans, go look into it. They have forgiven those loans, you know. So that's it. I need more than 10,000. Someone, someone you tells can, you can. They Joe have Biden. A for 50,000, but you have to reach out to them. Right, right. That's something I'm definitely pushing and organizing around. And Thalip, yes, you please yes, also definitely. get your group. 
you know, lead them. Yeah, 50 grand is a, a large amount of money, you know. Yes, absolutely. Okay, wonderful. And um, uh, Amina, I wanted to uh, chat with you. You keep getting bounced off, but um, you served as a political appointee in an executive level cabinet, and you were the youngest to do so at the time, or I'm sure but maybe until now. What are your takeaways from that experience? And just tell us a little bit more. What are the you know benefits of um, of uh, serving as a political appointee? Thank you, Symbol. Yeah, so, you know, this was a, a couple of years ago in, in St. Louis County government. And, um, you know, I think as we've always, you know, been talking about the importance of having more uh, Pakistani American women, Pakistani Americans, Muslim Americans in that public sphere. I think it's very important for us as a community to have individuals that serve on boards and commissions within our own cities, towns, municipalities, state, um, you know, I'm a very big proponent of local governments. I think that's where, you know, a lot of the uh, engagements take place. That's where, you know, you engage with your neighbors, with your coworkers, um, in your own community. And I think that's where you can really change mindsets. That's where you can really, um, you know, introduce this new idea of, hey, you know, we're all the same same regardless of where we come from, regardless of our race, ethnicity, et cetera, background. Um, so when I served as a political appointee in St. Louis County government, I uh, was very fortunate to serve in the executive uh, in the executive cabinet of the St. Louis County executive. And um, that meant that I had, um, you know, direct interaction with a lot of department heads, a lot of the different departments to talk about uh, ways to kind of implement more uh, immigrant friendly policies within the space of, of the local government. Um, and I think that my takeaway from there was, you know, this idea, this understanding that when we're working together to solve problems, the solutions also lie locally um, through a very multi stakeholder approach. And what that means is by by pulling in civil society, by pulling in our diaspora organizations, religious organizations, by pulling in civic engagement uh, organizations, by pulling in teachers and, and, and doctors and so forth to try to find solutions to problems, to our very localized problems, because, you know, all solutions I, I'm a big promoter of all solutions um, coming from within the local communities, within coming from local neighborhoods. And I think that that um, one of the, the main experiences that I was very fortunate to uh, to engage in was uh, helping to draft a policy for a hijab policy, a headscarf policy for um, for our community, which is now replicated across the United States um, in various justice services uh, departments. And I think that that was so important coming from a very conservative uh, space in St. Louis, where, you know, we had the Jewish community, the Muslim community, um, the at-large uh, uh, Christian community and other denominations coming together and, and understanding what that meant from a cultural perspective, from a religious perspective, um, and, and, you know, being tolerant, being sensitive, um, you know, it was around awareness, it was around understanding each other uh, as humans, and I think that that's what really led to, um, to everyone around the table, you know, just one, having a seat at the table, having a voice, um, and then realizing that, hey, you know, this is something we need to do because we need to focus on inclusive communities and inclusive societies because that is what helps us in the end. So, um, so you know, it, it, going back to political appointmentships, I think it's very important for our community to engage in those at in all different levels. I also serve on my uh, local parks board in my small town of Mills River, in North Carolina, and I think that you know, just having a say in what's going on in our community, whether it's our parks, it's our school board, I think that's very important, and it helps us project a voice and it helps us bring ourselves into that public space. Absolutely, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Um, so we are um, you know, uh, getting towards the end of our program. So I wanted to ask all of our panelists um, this final question. And um, it's basically, what advice would you give to young Black Sunny American women uh, looking to pursue political leadership opportunities, what advice would you give to the Pakistani American community at large? And we can start with uh, Mir Siddiqui. <laughs> As I yawn <laughs> constantly. Uh, you know, the advice I'd give is um, uh, to really uh, do it and take that opportunity. I think what I've seen is so many people, um, especially women, you know, they they they're like, let me, let me think about it. Let me research it. Let me, do I have the qualifications? Do I do this? Do I do that? Men, 
or get up and say, I, I'm going to run, you know? And, and so, you know, we, you have the power to do that. You have the power to run. You have to, the power to be involved. Um, and it's really important. Uh, I always say this, you know, you can't be what you can't see. And I think that uh, when there are people who look like us, who have our shared live uh, life experiences, change can happen. Uh, there's so much on the policy level, especially local level, you can do if you are involved. Uh, and so I would just say um, definitely reach out if you have questions uh, to your mentors. Um, you know, I, I, feel free to contact me anytime if you're interested. I think, you know, it re really is important to have each other uh, to ask questions, to say how hard was it? What's your advice? Um, so um, always ask questions and um, know that you have a supportive community uh, there for you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Sayed. What, what's your advice to the community? I agree with Mayor Siddiqui. Representation matters. And so for young women to see themselves in this position, it's important for us to continue to try. And the advice to them is, you know, if you dream something, then chase the dream. It's important for us to, to actually have that hope and to be able to see ourselves in these positions of change as change agents for our communities. So if you see something and you want to make a difference, then go make that difference. And there's definitely a community here of women who have also blazed some trails and we're here to support you and help you in any way we can. Thank you. Amina? I, you know, um, my comments will resonate with what everyone has already said. You know, again, as Sana said, representation matters. It's key. Our voice matters. And, you know, our, our representation needs to reflect what our community needs, um, where our community is now and where we're headed forward. I would like to also add some bold that we are at a very pivotal point within our diaspora community where we've seen, you know, a record number of Pakistani Americans trying to contest for elections, running for elections. Um, you know, uh, it's you know, engaged in that political process. Aisha, you were, you and Symbol were part of, you know, this dynamic upset that happened in Texas, where we saw this shift in Pakistani Americans just, you know, engaging in that sort of a political process. We saw that in Georgia as well. Um, and across the United States. And I think that, you know, with Sana, you're running, you know, Thalit, you're already in office doing great things. So will you as well? I think that this is such an exciting time because this is history in the making for our diaspora right now. And as a researcher, you know, who kind of just sits back and observes all of you guys as you're doing the amazing things that you're doing in your spaces, you know, I'm very excited and I think that, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to the next two years, to the next four years and 10 years on to see, you know, where we go. But I can say that, you know, right now with um, organizations in our community like PAC, PAC, MPAC, AP PAC, we're noticing that, you know, more women, more younger women are being mentored, uh, you know, to, to take those leadership uh, spots and spaces, no matter how difficult it is at times, right? But, um, but so I'm very hopeful and excited and and I'm very thankful for this conversation. And, and you know, my my thoughts with everyone else, especially younger women, is you know, um, if you have something to say, just say it. And you know, you will find your own kind of support out there. You know, we we exist. Other people other people exist as well. And you will find your own little group as well um, for that support. That's awesome. Thank you, Amina. Aisha, what advice do you have? Uh, sure. So my advice is, um, I guess, first for the young Pakistani American women out there, um, and this is also advice to myself, I have to remind myself of this on a daily basis, is don't get discouraged. I wish I could tell you that, you know, uh, being a, a Pakistani American and a political leadership is easy, but it's not. And, um, you know, you will very quickly build a thick skin, but regardless of what you're faced with, I mean, we saw everything under the sun during this Fox Nights for Biden campaign. Uh, it was a little unimaginable, uh, the types of experiences that myself and my colleagues had. But again, don't get discouraged. We need you here. We need your voices here. And uh, to the uh, Pakistani American brothers, um, you know, don't be part of the problem. Um, you know, the future is female. Uh, make some room. We're, we're, you know, again, this is this is going to help us all as a community. Uh, we have a lot to catch up on. So um, just you know, when you see when you see a Pakistani American woman that you know has expressed an interest, make sure that you you are part of uh, the solution. So that's my tip. 
Absolutely, the future is female. I love that. And Talat, what advice do you have for young Pakistani women and the Pakistani community? Well, I agree about. with everything everyone else said, you know, and piggybacking on uh, representation. As they say, if you're not at the table, then you're on the menu. So that is very important, you know. Uh, that's why it is important that our younger generation, especially the yeah, youth, they should get involved in um, local politics. And the best way to start is getting involved with the school boards, the school committees and the PTAs and, you know, the youth councils. And that is the way to move forward. Get involved, make a difference, educate yourself and empower yourself. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. I really enjoyed this discussion. It was amazing. I'm surrounded, you know, it's a powerhouse in here right now. So thank you all. Um, again, happy Women's Day and uh, happy International Women's Day to uh, all of our sisters across the world. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's all give us one to women.